So hi everyone and welcome to this webinar on the WHO Clinical Practice Handbook for Quality Abortion Care. We are pleased to see that so many of you have chosen to join us today in this webinar that's hosted by WHO, HRP and the IBP Network. My name is Caroline Ekman, and I will just uh, kick off this webinar by uh, going through some housekeeping rules before I hand over to my colleague, Karen Kim, who will be moderating this webinar today. Just want to let you know that this webinar will be recorded and we will be sharing the recording a few days after uh, this webinar. We do offer interpretation into three languages, Spanish, French, and Russian. So if you prefer to listen in to this webinar in any of those languages rather than in English, you can choose to do so. Simply click on the interpretation icon here in Zoom. We will also um, allocate some time at the end of this webinar for some questions and answers. So if you do have any questions, you are free to submit them at any time during the webinar. Um, we ask you to write your question in the Q&A, so in the question and answers uh, function. You can see that little icon here in Zoom saying Q&A. Please use that function to write your questions rather than writing them in the chat. So like I said, this webinar is uh, co-hosted by the IBP Network, uh, which is a network of organizations and individuals who are uh, interested in sexual reproductive health. Um, if you are interested in receiving invites to similar webinars, we strongly encourage you to become a member of the IBP network. It's free of charge and you can uh, easily sign up by going to our website, ibpnetwork.org. And on that note, I will hand over to Bella Ganatra, who is the unit head of the Prevention of Unsafe Abortion Unit at WHO, for some opening remarks. Please go ahead, Bella. Thank you, thank you, Carolyn. And it is my great pleasure and privilege on the behalf of HRP and our unit to welcome you to this webinar to celebrate the launch of the Clinical Practice Handbook. Of course, today is not the actual launch because some of you will recall that the guideline was launched at the ICM conference several weeks ago. But this is our first opportunity to look at the clinical handbook in detail. Many of you will be familiar with the first edition of this handbook, which came out in 2014 as a companion to our then consolidated guideline. As our guideline has now been updated, we have now updated the clinical practice handbook as well. And while it maintains some of the essential features of the previous version, there are many new elements to the, to the book as well, which we will soon hear about. This clinical practice handbook has been one of the most popular derivative products of our guidelines over the years. It has been a practical tool to enable health workers. And by health workers, I mean all cadres of health workers who are involved in the provision of abortion-related care as a practical tool to aid them in service provision. It's one of several tools to assist providers that we will be coming out with over the coming weeks, months, and the next year. Some of the other things will include blended digital learning tools as well, but all of them will essentially build on the information that is found here in the Clinical Practice Handbook. So we do hope that you will enjoy learning about this tool and will use it widely in your work. And with that, let's get straight to it. Karen? Take us away. Thank you, Bella. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It is a, a, my pleasure to be moderating and introducing our esteemed panelists. And we are warmly welcoming you and have been very excited to provide an overview and a glimpse into the different um, on the ground activities that have been through our 
guidelines and derivative products. And so without further ado, I'm happy to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Mekdis Rodorafel. And Dr. Rodorafel is an obstetrician and gynecologist doing a subspecialty training in family planning and reproductive health at St. Paul's Hospital Millennium Medical College in Addis. Mekdis is currently working with the WHO Department of Sexual and Reproductive Health and Research, and specifically with both the abortion and the contraception teams. And she has been very much a part of the process of the updates for the Clinical Practice Handbook for Quality Abortion Care. She'll be taking us through a, a tour of this new handbook. And so I have handed over to her now. Uh, thank you, uh, Karen, for the introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to give you an overview of the new clinical handbook and highlight some of the new uh, elements of the handbook. Next slide, please. This handbook is intended to facilitate the practical application of the clinical recommendations from WHO's 2022 abortion care guideline. It can be used by a range of health workers recommended in the abortion care guideline in different health settings and uh, legal backgrounds. Next slide, please. This handbook is a revised and updated version of the 2014 clinical handbook for safe abortion according to the abortion care uh, guideline. Next slide. The clinical practice handbook for Quality abortion care guides health worker in giving clinical care to a woman from a pre-abortion to post-abortion uh, period. It's easy uh, to follow, user-friendly and comprehensive. It also highlights uh, and integrates how health workers can apply human rights principles across the continuum of care of uh, abortion. And next slide. Some of the examples of human rights principle in the handbook are to ensure that abortion care is always provided respectfully with uh, compassion, uh, provide complete, accurate, and easy to understand information in multiple and accessible forms and languages. And when dealing with adolescents, ask if the young person wants parental involvement, and if they do, uh, encourage their parents to engage supportively by offering information and education but we don't insist on such person uh, authorization unless it's a legal requirement. And you can find additional human rights principle incorporated throughout the handbook. Next slide. The pre-abortion uh, uh, chapter includes information, ca counseling and decision-making, medical history, physical examination, laboratory and other investigations, determining the gestational age of pregnancy, infection prevention and control, and finally inducing fetal acetol prior to abortion posture. Next slide, please. One of the parts that I want to uh, highlight is information, counseling, and decision-making. Here we provide accurate, high-quality evidence-based information about the whole abortion care process. We offer counseling only for those who wish to receive it, and the counseling can be any time during the abortion care. Then we facilitate informed decision-making. Uh, there is a table in the handbook which a health worker can quickly refer for appropriate method of abortion uh, based on gestational age, mode of termination, that's either medical or surgical, and according to the individual medical needs. Here we also give self-management option for gestational age up to uh, 12 weeks. Next slide, please. This slide shows a green pop-out notes found throughout the handbook, which highlight noteworthy message to the health worker. Here you can see one of the notes says routine laboratory testing is not a prerequisite pro for providing abortion services. On the other side, you can see also that being other message being integrated in the handbook about ultrasound is not a prerequisite for abortion uh, service. Next slide, please. Induction of fetal acetol before an abortion is one of the new additions to the clinical handbook. Uh, here you can see there is a clear and easy to follow steps uh, being laid out. 
And one can also found the regimens used in the fetal acetal induction uh, in the clinical practice uh, handbook. Next slide. Then we'll come to the abortion section with medical abortion and surgical uh, abortion as a subsections. Next. In medical abortion, in addition to methods used for medical abortion, the handbook includes new additions like self-management approach section, pain management, management of missed abortion, and management for uh, intratrine fetal demise. Next slide. This chart shows a summary of recommendation on the medical management of uh, abortion. This summary is also available on a pocket card and on your website. Here, using letrozole along with misoprostol is also included in the summary as an alternative regimen in medical uh, abortion. Next slide. So this table is not from the clinical practice handbook, but it shows the range of health workers who can provide quality abortion care. It is seen here as all health workers recommended by the abortion care guideline can give medical abortion uh, in part or in a whole when gestational age is less than uh, 12 weeks of gestation. Next slide. Self-management of medical abortion in a whole or a part outside healthcare facilities and your approach included in this handbook, which is a safe and evidence-based alternative for managing and following women for uh, abortion care, and recognition of multiple service delivery approaches, including telemedicine for medical abortion is also emphasized. Telemedicine can be used for information provision, counseling, assessing gestational age, post-abortion care, and whenever it's important for purpose of uh, referral. Next slide. Uh, in this uh, clinical handbook, Pain management is one of the areas which is given due attention. Both pharmacological and non-pharmacological uh, pain management uh, options for medical abortions are detailed to the extent of using uh, epidural analgesia for gestational age above 12 weeks whenever it's available and indicated. Next slide, please. This table shows the new uh, recommendation from the abortion care guideline in the medical management of missed abortion, less than uh, 14 weeks of gestation. Next, next slide. And also uh, this slide shows the medical management of the intratrine uh, fetal uh, demise. So when it comes to surgical uh, abortion, uh, the subsections include summary of methods for surgical abortion, pain management for surgical abortion, cervical priming prior to surgical abortion, vacuum aspiration for a surgical abortion at less than 14 weeks of gestation, and surgical abortion at greater than or equal to 14 weeks of gestation. The highlighted contents are new, uh, updated, and more detailed practice compared to the previous handbook. Next slide. Surgical abortion includes administrating uh, uh, antibiotic prophylaxis, pre- and periprosture, pain management during uh, cervical priming in surgical abortion, cervical priming, conducting the abortion procedure using the method selected, overseeing patient recovery and discharge finally. Next slide. This table shows methods of uh, cervical priming using pharmacological, uh, that is medication and or uh, osmotic dilator at different gestational age. Further, you can also find an example of how to insert osmotic dilators in the clinical practice handbook, and also a table on characteristics of osmotic dilators are also can be found there. Next. Also for surgical abortion, there is a due focus on pain management. Uh, pain management for cervical uh, priming in addition to parenteral and uh, PO pain medications for gestational age greater than or equal to 14 weeks using paracervical block for cervical priming is suggested. An example of how to administer paracervical block is also provided. Pain management for surgical abortion with a continuum of uh, sedation, including general anesthesia, when it's needed, is also described there. Next. This is a snapshot 
uh, from the handbook. It shows the general steps for surgical abortion uh, in the table, the general steps. And then on the other side, each steps being further uh, elaborated. The same is true for vacuum, I mean, general manual aspiration for less than 14 weeks of gestation. Next slide. Finally, on the post-abortion section, it includes care prior to discharge from uh, healthcare facility after the abortion, follow-up care after an abortion, uh, whenever it's indicated, otherwise there is no follow-up care after uncomplicated abortion, management of incomplete abortion, assessing and managing complications, and post-abortion contraception. Next slide. Included, we can find the medical management of incomplete abortion and when it's appropriate to use uh, misoprostol for managing uh, medical uh, abortion. Next. And if, if the girl or the woman wishes to use uh, post-abortion contraception, options along their category of medical eligibility criteria can be found. And as you can see here, almost all contraception methods can be used in post-abortion period with no restriction for uh, their use being, they, they all being as category one, except for the intrauterine devices after uh, septic abortion. Next slide. Okay, so I know I have said a lot about the clinical practice handbook, but there is still more to be found on the clinical practice handbook and you can find the clinical practice handbook on the website displayed. And you can also access summaries of the recommendations and medical abortion uh, pocket card by scanning the QR codes on this slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Over to you, Kara. Thank you, Matisse. So in this handbook, as um, Matisse has highlighted, and in, as well as in the linked product, um, the American <laughs> Abortion Care Guidelines. Now, there is um, the highlights of quality abortion care. And as well with, with the new guidelines, there's a wider network of health worker types that can provide quality abortion care. So with that, we can turn our attention to our next panelist who will be speaking on these aspects. So we have Bill Powell. He is a nurse practitioner with almost 40 years of healthcare experience in both the domestic and international settings. As a clinician, his experience ranges from providing and coordinating refugee healthcare in Eastern Sudan to providing primary care in rural clinics in the Appalachian Mountain communities in the US. Uh, Bill has been working with IPAS for 17 years as a senior advisor with a specific focus on enhancing the quality of clinical content and technical guidelines produced by IPAS and providing technical assistance on abortion related care, both within IPAS and with external partners. And so it is my pleasure to be introducing him for his talk. Go ahead, take it away, Bill. Uh, thank you. Uh, Karen, and, and greetings to everyone. Uh, it's really an honor to participate in this webinar today representing the IPASS Impact Network, which is celebrating its 50th year of action and leadership in improving global abortion care availability, uh, access, and quality. Next slide, please. You know, IPASS was formed in 1973 to continue development of the manual vacuum aspirator, which, as you all know, is an essential tool for safe abortions. And IPASS has continued to work ever since to make high quality abortion care a priority. Although our earliest work was all about changing abortion technology, uh, work on abortion quality has moved well beyond that in most cases. 50 years uh, of research consistently concludes that quality matters in so many aspects of abortion care, including but not limited to patients' experiences and outcomes, abortion timing, decision making, future healthcare decisions, reducing stigma, et cetera. There's really so much we could talk about today. Um, if you could click for the animation, please. Uh, but in the next few minutes, I'm just going to talk about these three areas 
of our abortion care quality work that you see here on the screen. VCAT, um, the pain management uh, that's already been mentioned, and then ways of reducing over-medicalization and improving the patient-centeredness of abortion care. Next slide. So IPASS has used abortion values clarification or VCAT activities now for over 15 years. And you can see um, the original curriculum on the bottom left um, of the screen, as well as subsequent adaptations that have been developed and are available and have been used. Now these materials have been used with healthcare workers, other facility staff, managers, policy makers, community members, et cetera. Um, and just as a quick review, VCAT is designed to help participants challenge deeply held assumptions and myths, clarify and affirm their values and potentially resolve values conflicts, potentially transform their beliefs and attitudes that impact their behaviors, and ideally at the end they state their intentions to act in accordance with their affirmed values. And we have found that once participants have clarified their values that inform their beliefs about abortion and understood the root causes and consequences of unsafe abortion, they often undergo a transformation of attitude on the provision and or support of safe abortion care and their role in assuring women's access to safe care to prevent them from dying from unsafe abortion. Next slide. As you can see in the quote on the screen, 11 years ago in the 2012 WHO safe abortion guidance, providers negative attitudes were listed as one of the barriers to safe abortion care. But negative attitudes and the other barriers that you see listed on the slide are not only barriers to care, but they're also barriers to the quality of the care and may directly affect patients experience of care. Next slide, please. So here is one example uh, of how a health worker's attitudes negatively affected her abortion care quality and how VCAT directly improved it. Um, this is from a practicing obstetrician gynecologist in Zambia who now advocates publicly for, publicly for women's right to comprehensive abortion care. And in an interview published over 10 years ago, she discussed how um, I pass this value clarification workshop helped her become an advocate for compassionate service provision. It's with deep regret she recalled how prior to the VCAT experience, she treated women badly when they came in suffering from abortion related complications. And she remembered performing MVA for patients. And she says, I quote, I just used to do it because it was part of my job. I was one person who wouldn't give pain relief. I used to feel, okay, those who I felt had induced abortion serves them right. Let them feel the pain. Maybe next time they won't have an abortion. Maybe next time they will be more careful. I was that kind of doctor. So her frank admission of past mistreatment and discrimination against women seeking abortion care is a prime example of why clinical training, which is critical, is often not sufficient. And VCAT uh, is also needed and helpful to ensure service provision and access that respects all women's right to high quality abortion care, as well as other medical care. Next slide, please. So it's, it's hard. It's hard to understand, but there remains among some people in some places the idea that pain management is not needed for abortion care because, and I quote what we hear sometimes, our women don't feel pain, or it's a quick procedure, or it's not that different from her menses, et cetera. Of course, we know that everyone feels pain and as safe and effective as the recommended abortion technologies are, there is still pain with either option. And we know that pain increases anxiety and that neglecting pain management um, as a 
punishment for having an abortion, as we saw in the previous example, is a violation of human rights. For medical abortion, the evidence supports the use of analgesia and at the very least, the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs like ibuprofen instead of paracetamol or acetaminophen. And ideally, the NSAIDs would be dispensed by the health worker so that we know that the person has them. But of course, this is not the case in many settings. So challenges remain in assuring that these analgesics are available and used. And that challenge is even greater when we consider pain management for self-managed abortion. And for MVA, the combination of NSAIDs and paracervical blocks should be routinely used. Um, and I'll say more about that in a moment. Pain management has been and continues to be an area that demands ongoing attention and is an area that we have focused on in our programs with education, stressing the evidence, refreshers as needed, job aids, and monitoring as um, pain management as a sentinel indicator for quality. And I will add, as you saw in the previous slides by MECDES, that these points are very strongly stressed in the new clinical practice handbook we are here to celebrate today. Next slide, please. So we know the evidence supports the use of paracervical block for MVA, and the evidence also supports the use of paracervical block by all the cadres of health workers who are recommended by WHO as abortion providers. But we have found the uptake of paracervical block to be obstructed at times by either policy barriers or practice barriers, sometimes both. Policy barriers are most commonly because paracervical block is not included in the national standards and guidelines, or all the cadres of abortion healthcare workers are not included as eligible to administer it. And some practice-based barriers we have encountered include those health workers who, although they've been trained on paracervical block, just refuse to change. And this is sometimes referred to as being strong but wrong. Um, in other cases, some are reluctant to implement the block because they feel they need more specialized supplies like very long spinal needles in order to provide the care. Uh, each of these um, challenges take time to address and require cause specific strategies um, beyond, again, um, just training or supplying. So policymakers have responded to a deep dive into the evidence and a review of the global guidance, as well as uh, sometimes bringing examples from other like countries and to partnering with them to update standards and guidelines according to the latest evidence. And for practice barriers, we've used training or retraining along with clinical mentoring, demonstrations with various versions of supplies, showing examples from other like countries and even using study tours where we took perhaps change makers or champions to see what it, how it happens in another country and bring that back to their own. Job aids, as you see on the right side of the slide, and even some peer pressure uh, through provider networking meetings and data sharing and review uh, opportunities. Next slide. Finally, let's just look at four aspects of abortion care quality that we are thinking about and working on uh, that are focused on making abortion care simple, safe, and more acceptable. Next slide, please. So the first is having and using the right tools. And we have MVA and MA drugs, which are proven to be safe, simple, and effective. And perhaps new technologies will come along as well. But as I mentioned earlier, these recommended technologies are still not used uniformly everywhere. Sharp curatage is still available and used in many places despite the guidance against it. Remember that strong but wrong phrase? I often repeat one of the core truths of quality improvement and that is to make it easy to do what is right and hard to do what is wrong. And in this case, if only MVA and MA drugs were available and if sharp curettes were not available, we would be adhering to that truth. So let's, let's try to make that happen. Yeah, please click for the animation. The right staff, of course, refers to well-trained and willing, willing healthcare workers and with systems that are fully embracing and implementing 
um, the task shifting, task sharing guidance, and working to build supportive teams, networks, and cultures of safety that will improve care and outcomes. Next slide. Through VCAT and health worker training, thoughtful service design and ongoing measurement of and action on the patient's experience of care, we can improve abortion care quality, making it more person-centered, equitable, affordable, and accessible. And let me put in a couple of plugs here. One for the abortion care quality or ACQ tool that you see a small image of on the left of your screen. This was something we developed with our colleagues in IBIS Reproductive Health and Metrics for Management, and with the participation of experts from many organizations, including WHO. It's a short set of indicators developed by an international panel of experts through extensive research and usability testing to provide an accurate assessment of the quality of abortion services um, that an individual has received during and after their abortion experience. And the tool is designed for both in-facility and out-of-facility use, such as at pharmacies or at Heartlines. So you can use the QR code uh, on the image to access the ACQ tool site. And the other plug um, that I got permission to share is that WHO is currently working on a new abortion care measurement framework that promises to be quite comprehensive and uh, very helpful in all of this work. And then we also must consider how abortion care can become more holistic and integrated, such as with the integration of abortion care and GBV, gender-based violence management, employing many of the survivor-centered and trauma-informed approaches that make care more acceptable and effective. And then considering how intersectionality can help us understand how gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, et cetera, all shape the care that patients experience. Finally, we, like most on this call, are committed to supporting a person's right to have an abortion using pills on their own when and where they want, and to pursuing new models of care, models of self-care <clears throat> that meet people's wants and needs. We're working to generate new evidence, share knowledge, and explore clinical and regulatory questions within this rapidly evolving area. This also involves work on centering the health worker's role in self-managed abortion <clears throat> and on working toward equitable access to quality, <clears throat> quality assured medications for those that need them. And we look forward to continuing partnerships with WHO and many other partners in this exciting and important work. Last slide, please. So I hope you found these notes on some of IPASS's work on abortion care quality interesting. I want to thank WHO for inviting me to speak and also repeat that many aspects of what I discuss are highlighted in the new abortion care guidelines and this clinical practice handbook. Thanks again and over to you, Karen. Thank you so much, Bill. All right. And so continuing on with our next panelist, who is also putting these recommendations into action. We have Dr. Radhika Komandan. Dr. Radhika Komandan is an obstetrician gynecologist and the director of the Reproductive Health Training Center and Regional SRHR Coalition. She's also an associate professor at State Medical University in Moldova. She is a consultant and working for the Women Help Women organization and has been a longtime consultant with other partners, including ourselves, the WHO, Concept Foundation, and, and um, Genuity, and has been really increasing access to quality abortion services, MVA, and medical abortion. So please, I hand the mic over to Dr. Carmen. Go ahead. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this very interesting and uh, very optimistic webinar. Please, next. Uh, the RHPC uh, in the Republic of Moldova is a non-governmental organization with a mission to protect and promote the reproductive and sexual health and rights. We had been the coordinating organization for International Consortium for Medical Abortion 
uh, we um, were nominated in 2015 by UNFPA as regional training center on development and implementation of the evidence-based protocols on uh, sexual reproductive health. We successfully managed uh, several important projects. I want to mention the strategic assessment of abortion services in partnership with WHO, UNFPA, and other organizations in Moldova and in the region. Uh, ongoing projects we are uh, now implementing uh, are setting up the stage for regional scaling up of medical abortion via telemedicine in Eastern Europe. This is a uh, Grand Challenges Canada Options Initiative project. And the two projects sponsored by Safe Abortion Action Fund dedicated particularly to the uh, implementation in Moldova, in Transnistria, post conflict area, and in the region uh, of the latest WHO recommendation from 2022. Uh, since 2018, we have been the coordinated organization for the Sexual Reproductive Health Rights Regional Coalition. Next, please. Uh, despite permissive laws, and a well-developed network of facilities, access to high-quality contraception, abortion, and reproductive health care is still denied to many women in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, with the consequence that an important part of all maternal deaths in the region are due to unsafe abortion. Also, medical abortion pills are registered in all the countries of the region. Medical abortion is significantly underutilized representing as few as 5 to 10 percent of abortions in some countries. The regional training center based in Moldova has planned to improve on this by supporting countries in the region to improve access to high quality safe abortion services. Next, please. Talking about how important for us uh, is the latest safe abortion uh, guideline. I couldn't omit to pay tribute to the previous WHO publication on this matter, starting with the first in 2004. When I had uh, in my hands the draft of this publication, I thought this is exactly what I needed at that time. I was very happy. I knew by heart all these clinical recommendations, and I still use some of them. I especially appreciated the first ever presented relationship of abortion to human rights, and I have used this a lot in my trainings. This publication guided the strategic assessment in several countries in the region. And based on the findings of the assessment, the development of the national protocols to improve the quality of care. Next, please. The next publications continue to guide our project in Moldova in other Eastern European countries. Uh, for example, in our attempt to update the national protocols on safe abortion, uh, in collaboration with Conce Foundation, we developed a very interesting tool, a template containing all the recommendations, starting with the policy regulatory framework, information and counseling, and the clinical recommendations. The temp template allowed the country teams to compare the existing protocols on abortion care in their countries, to see the gaps, and to include in the updated protocol those recommendations which were missing. Uh, to ensure the sustainability, the medical university and post-graduation training programs were updated and approved. Uh, those were the revised national protocols and training curricula reflected the recommended by WHO for the demedicalization of abortion care. Medical abortion was extended up to 12 weeks um, with the permission to take myth and miles at home, simplify regimen, accent to self-care and on women's role, in surgical abortion, local anesthesia for MVA, EVA, uh, abortion at the prim primary level of care. Next, please. Uh, you can see here some uh, pictures from the training of trainers who conducted in the same countries uh, to reflect and to uh, build the capacity of academic staff and abortion providers uh, on the WHO latest recommendation, but also uh, on the um, specificities of the approved national protocols. Next, please. Um, WHO guided abortion care during pandemic, and I want to mention that it was extremely important. And these two messages, which were in the guidance, the 2020 guidance, that abortion belongs to essential health services, and the recommendation, a very strong one, to use non surgical method and to use telemedicine for medical abortion. We made sure that these messages were passed to the Ministry of Health. 
in Moldova, the Ministry of Health took very seriously these recommendations and these um, statements. We obtained uh, by this the support for offering medical abortion by telemedicine in Moldova. And GCC project on piloting the medical abortion via telemedicine became in March 2020 the only one way to access safe abortion for Moldovan women. We enrolled in a couple of months 500 women instead of 200. The results were amazing, efficacy 98%, just 2% of complications, very small complications which needed management in person, 99% of patient satisfaction. Ministry of Health declared their support. In August, in August 2020, uh, we included the medical abortion via telemedicine in the updated national abortion standards. We ensured the broad mass media coverage, the problem of lack of access to abortion during the pandemic was raised by the journalists. The discussion attracted a lot of attention, good and not so good comments. We needed to deal with the anti-choice movement, which were silent beforehand. But and in this case, again, WHO messages uh, were very helpful. Next, please. Um, and finally, in 22, on 9th of March, WHO published the Safe Abortion Care Guideline with the inclusion of recommendations on self-management of safe, for safe abortion and family planning. In order to ensure that stakeholders in the region are aware of this recommendation, that first must be translated and distributed accordingly. And the translation uh, in, into Russian, uh, we appreciate it is very much because English, it is an issue in the region. Uh, nevertheless, this is not enough to raise knowledge and awareness. Thus, we propose to engage the holders from across the region in open dialogue about self-managed medical abortion, the use of telemedicine for medical abortion, and the feasibility of introducing such services in their countries an alternative service delivery option as recommended in the guideline. This facilitates the gathering and dissemination of necessary information for next steps in introducing self-care interventions. Next, please. Following the organization of discussions and the presentation of evidence on this matter, academic staff responsible for facilitating safe abortion family planning models will be engaged to training of trainers. During 22, 23 years, the guidelines and recommendations were presented in the webinars, roundtables, National Obigen Association conferences. During discussions, stakeholders have the opportunity to express any concerns related to self-care medical abortion, and their concerns are addressed by qualified experts, including colleagues directly from WHO. And the support from European office and from WHO headquarters, RCP, uh, has been a great help. Probably this is the first time ever a uh, person directly from Geneva was present, uh, I mean, Karen Kim, directly present at the numerous conferences in the, in the region. And uh, uh, also very important to mention within the GCC project, formative research on feasibility of using telemedicine for medical abortion was finalized in five countries. Results showed women no telemedicine for medical abortion and wanted very much, they mentioned this. Pilot study on telemedicine uh, medical abortion successfully were conducted in Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, and Ukraine, coordinated by Genuity Health Projects. We started the same pilot study in Kyrgyzstan on telemedicine in medical abortion. We have had a very good start, and we plan to continue in Kazakhstan and in Transnistria. Next, please. Uh, the, and finally, the clinical practice handbook for quality abortion care. We salute very much this new publication. This is a, a, a huge help because it's complementing the abortion care guideline with the concrete practical recommendations, which we are going to use in our trainings. It gives us confidence. It is our backup that we are right on saying some, something on clinical care. And of course, the request would be that please give us the Russian version. I would appreciate this very much. Next, please. Uh, what we can say uh, right now in a few words that further stakeholders capacity building is needed on what is self-management and how to use telemedicine for medical abortion. We still see many misunderstandings on this matter. More support from WHO country office will be very helpful in obtaining Ministry of Health commitments to implement the recent WHO recommendations especially those on law and policy, which uh, according to their opinion, sound very radical for them. 
Engaging women's groups, NGOs, community mobilization is crucial to further promote self-managed medical abortion, to increase the demand for quality services and obtain the necessary support from the medical systems. We need to adapt our language, which is sometimes too technical, for better communication to be understood, heard, and supported by them. I would very much recommend this publication, which we have used as advocacy tools to get the stakeholder support in Moldova and in some countries in the region. Next, please. Thank you very much. And I would like particularly to thank to all the partners, uh, our donors, which made possible uh, these activities in the region and in my country, Moldova. Thank you. Thank you so much, Radhika. So that has concluded the presentations and we do have some time to address a few questions before we close. So um, I am going to direct the first question to Mekdis and I will read it out loud. And um, there is a question asking about further explanation on the advanced vacuum aspiration um, and just highlighting the similarity and differences with the um, MVA up to 16 weeks. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, when you say advanced vacuum aspiration, it's using either manual or electrical uh, vacuum aspirator at or beyond 40 weeks of uh, gestation. Especially with the electronic vacuum aspiration, we can use cannula size up to 16 millimeter uh, for uh, abortion care, given that the cervix is uh, well uh, dilated, so it can be used between like 15 to 16 weeks. And also, given that the cervix is well dilated, we can use this advanced uh, vacuum aspiration for post-abortion care, like for incomplete abortion or uh, inevitable uh, abortion. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And then um, this next one, I'll just have Bill who was able to answer, but maybe just highlighting it because this is a nice update. But there was a question about the IPAS is VCAT toolkit and what the status of it um, for the update of the toolkit. So if you want to just uh, um, provide us a little more information on that. Sure. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the global uh, toolkit, um, the original toolkit published in 2008, um, ha has gone undergone a, a re revision and update, um, and is currently um, in layout for publication. So we're excited about that, and it will be posted and available on our website soon. I can't give a date yet. Um, not in touch exactly with that timing process, but it is in uh, production and or layout and should be available soon. And then I would just mention that the other versions uh, that you saw on the slide are all available on the website as well. Um, each of them has occurred over time, um, of course, addressing different populations, whether, whether it's youth, humanitarian audiences, disability, uh, and now one for self-care. And so in each of those iterations, you might notice some slight changes or updates and, and advancements along the way. And then the last thing I'll add is that we are working on um, a toolkit for virtual uh, VCAT facilitation, which we did um, and had were forced to do with uh, COVID-19 and found some ways to do that that we feel are uh, and have proven to be effective. So we will be working on a, are, are working on a, a toolkit that will talk about how to modify uh, the cat activities in the virtual environment. Thank you. Okay, very good, thank you. And that is exciting. <laughs> I, I well understand the uh, update process, it takes time, but we look forward to seeing that product. Um, so we have another clinical question that I will have um, Mekdi's address. Um, and it's asking about uh, what self-management um, in abortion 
um, what exactly it is and what it's meant by it. Is it the patient managing it by herself or buying over-the-counter medicines? So that would be great to um, provide some more information on that aspect. Okay, again, thank you for uh, the question. When we say self-management of medical abortion, it has uh, three parts. The first one is uh, assessing gestational age and assessing eligibility criteria. Uh, the second one is uh, the abortion process uh, itself, taking the medication that is either mifepristol plus misoprostol or misoprostol alone. Uh, we don't have lethrosol and misoprostol in self-management. Uh, and then finally, uh, making sure the abortion process is uh, uh, complete. So when we say self-management, it doesn't mean that like the whole process is being done by the uh, woman. It might be when the setup allows it, but it can be also in part. Let's say that if she's not sure about her gestational age, then here comes other service delivery options like telemedicine or nearby health facilities can be used for those. So it can be either in part or in a whole in any time if uh, the woman wants to uh, have health care uh, at health facility or we give the whole information when she can uh, come back or visit. So we will lay out the inform information is like the base of self-management. So if she's fully uh, informed, then uh, that's what we call self-management uh, uh, of abortion. And it's for gestational age less than uh, 12 weeks. It is safe and it's also uh, evidence-based. Uh, thank you. Great, thank you. And as uh, Mekdi said, highlighted, this is um, an, a, an option and that is has been integrated and woven throughout the clinical practice handbook to um, for consideration for the health workers to support the woman in taking, you know, uh, certain components, being involved in certain components or all of the process. Um, so several questions are coming in. So I'm going to group a little bit of it and direct the next one to Radhika. <laughs> now we have Radhika to speak um, and just wanted to respond to Radhika's comment about having the clinical practice handbook translated in Russian. Um, and that is in the works as well as with Spanish and French, we are um, prioritizing those languages. So that will be in the pipeline. Um, but in as for um, just a broad question, just because I'm seeing aspects of dissemination, implementation, and Radhika, you spoke, um, you know, and touched on the various aspects to your experience. And at the crux of that really has been um, your your efforts in disseminating the, the WHO guidelines and the derivative products. And you also nicely captured some points on the lessons learned and taking things forward. So I was hoping for you to expand it further as we now have this new product, um, um, not only in the dissemination of this product, but in the implementation of the recommendations. What would be um, additional tips and advice as we move forward? Uh, thank you, Karen. Thank you, colleagues, who uh, uh, asked uh, the questions. Uh, well, uh, what else was very useful in our practice and we would like to continue is to identify the champions in countries, uh, people who are the most advanced, who know uh, much better the situation in the country, but also know the recommendations to base, the, to base our interventions on their support, their help. Also, uh, to uh, insist on meetings with the ministries of health to try to build the capacity of the ministries of health as well, because people in the ministry are not the experts. Uh, and uh, many times uh, in this personal communication, you answer the que their questions and can move forward with your plans, with your programs. Also, uh, of course, it's very important to consider countries specific needs and to build your strategies on answering to these specific needs which uh, uh, you can find out in assessments and the strategic assessment of abortion services, which we conducted was a very helpful tool, very important um, strategy we have used. I can only recommend using this and uh, many other aspects uh, depending on the situation. 
Thank you so much. Okay, so I think we will um, close and uh, we'll just bring you to this slide so that we can show you where you can find the clinical practice handbook. And then um, as mentioned several times, it's a uh, link to the abortion care guidelines. So you can see the QR code and the, and the uh, links to it. Also wanted to say that at, on both of these pages, you'll see additional links to, uh, to products that are produced from the prevention of unsafe abortion team. And um, the two links that are most relevant to today's topic on the clinical practice handbook is um, the summary chart of the medical abortion regimens and then the pocket card. These are both um, practical tools for, for the health worker um, either to put up uh, or just to keep in their pocket, um, just to have on hand um, the medical abortion regimens and other aspects of um, quality abortion care provision. So those links will also be found at these, um, this, these main web pages. Uh, and then also wanted to put in a, a also another product that, which um, has been very closely linked to the abortion care guideline is the family planning and comprehensive abortion care toolkit. And that is highlighting the competencies acquired or needed for the health worker in providing um, comprehensive abortion care and family planning. But this is most relevant, not only because this uh, toolkit and the competencies really helped in our recommendation formulation for the abortion care guideline for all of our health worker recommendations, but it's really, um, you know, very relevant here because as, as Mekdis has pointed out in her overview of the handbook, how there, this, this is a handbook for a wide range of health workers because in our abortion care guideline, we really captured and expanded the type of health workers that can um, provide quality abortion care. So um, all these products can be found at these links. So hopefully you can explore and, and um, find some useful ways to, to implement these. Uh, and next slide, and just as uh, additional information on, on what not only our team is doing, but um, the, as, as Carolyn had highlighted, the platform that our Department of Sexual and Reproductive Health and Research um, are also working through into disseminating our products is through the IBP. So here, here's an additional link to explore and find additional resources. So with that, uh, we are just with one minute short. We thank you for your time and, and we'll continue to stay connected and hopefully you found this useful and and please um you know uh, don't hesitate in in sharing and and offering questions um as as you have been now registered and so we have a link to to getting feedback thank you <laughs>